Welcome to USA Football's Coach and Coordinator Podcast, where top football coaches from around the country share their stories, philosophies, concepts, and strategies to help you get better on and off the field. Now, here's your host, Keith Grabowski. On today's podcast, we're going to discuss understanding and gaining more understanding in order to create change, and a lot of this really is through education. And joining us on the podcast is uh, someone who's been on here often before, but uh, I'm glad to have him back again, a professor at the University of Denver, Brian Garrity. Brian, it's great to be talking with you here. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Keith. A uh, pleasure to be with you guys. Uh, timely topic and uh, something that, you know, luckily I've just kind of been writing and thinking about, especially in the last few years. So um, appreciate you having me on. Yeah, and, and for me it was seeing a post you, you had on Facebook um, about the chapter in your textbook that you just wrote for coaching education uh, that was released early uh, and is out there for everybody right now. And I think it's, for me, it actually actually created more understanding for me. So I appreciate that you wrote it. And I want to discuss and, and go over uh, some of the things in that chapter today. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just start with what you listed as the objectives, because I think these, these are really good. And I think it kind of outlines what, what we can talk about here. Number one, articulate an understanding of, of white privilege. And I think that's important because... Um, you know, with anything, terms, um, definitions can, can get hijacked by different people who don't understand it and misuse it, et cetera. So I think it's important that we art- articulate that. And number two, identify ways that sport coaches could implement racially sensitive and anti-racist practices at multiple levels, interpersonal, intrapersonal uh, group and organizational and three, integrate racially sensitive and anti-racist practices through coach education programs. And, and what I really liked about this, this chapter, Brian, is there was a lot of stuff that you put in here that was actionable, both in helping uh, our at- athletes to understand some of these concepts. I mean, you have some very uh, uh, good exercises that coaches can do, uh, but also as, as we, we come out of this, you know, Highly sensitive time, um, you know, a, a time when there's there's a lot of, uh, I think, people on edge and back and forth at each other that we do have to come out of this with something that's actionable. We have to do something to create change. It's not just that I'm going to go donate to this cause or that cause or, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to go out and just, you know, I'll protest and, and hold a sign. Like at the end of the day, None of this matters. I think it's it's important that people see uh, this is upsetting, that it's not okay. But at the end of the day, if we don't do anything to take action to change it, we got nowhere. Yeah, you know, for me, when I hear you talk about these things too, right, nobody wants to be, or at least I don't want to be like the professor. You know, I, I was a coach and coached for years. And then and I just enjoy writing and doing research and, you know, the, the life of, of, of being in the ac- academia and higher education fits for me. You know, so I still love coaching and being around athletes and, and working with folks. But, you know, I moved from away from coaching in order to kind of do this work. And I didn't want to do the same old stuff. And in this chapter in particular, is easy. For, it, it was, it was, I talked about myself because I have the safety net of being a professor, you know, now a tenured professor um, in a very supportive department in college that, is interested in this work. Um, so I don't really face a blowback, you know, and I think about teaching our students and, and they possibly do, you know, when you post stuff on social media or you talk about some of these issues and if somebody doesn't like the way you speak about it, right, you can get fired or discriminated against and maybe they hold a grudge or they won't give you a recommendation. So for me, I always want to be applied and I enjoy storytelling. Uh, and in this chapter and then other work that I've done, I've tried to do that. Um, you know, showing the reality of it in everyday life. In this, you know, you do point out in the beginning of the chapter that it it is, you know, the focus is about race. And and I think it's important we focus on that right now. But it's uh, Mm -hmm. acknowledging the importance of intersectionality, right? Which means a way of talking about how different identities overlap and intersect within a system of power, 
that privileges some and dif- disenfranchises others. So while we focus on race, this isn't um, just bound to only that. There's there's a lot of other mm-hmm. things that we can look at too. Certainly our conversation today will, will be uh, more about that because that I think is is important to discuss right now, but this extends beyond that as well. But we'll take examples of us. And, you know, I grew up in, you know, I'm, I live in Denver now, but I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. And my mom's family was, uh, came in from Russia. They were fleeing uh, persecution there as Russian Jews. And she ended up marrying my father and had me. And, and my dad's family is Irish Catholic uh, from Ireland, had one generation in New York. And, you know, if you grew up in the east side of Cleveland, uh, you know, for me, I, you know, right. You just grow up. You don't realize that you've got a high Jewish population, you know, uh, all, all sorts of kind of religious Jews too, Orthodox, conservative reform. You've obviously got in, in city areas and around you, uh, more Christians. Uh, then you've got a strong Irish Catholic. You've got Italians in little Italy, downtown Cleveland. Uh, so you've got this wealth of, you know, kind of white European uh, backgrounds and, and people and then you've got a highly urban area, too, with a lot of black folk that have been there for years. And so just having lived there and then lived down in Tennessee and Mississippi and now Colorado um, and reading more of this work and doing it, you start to appreciate, you know, how white people don't necessarily talk about race. They talk about their like I just did. Right. They talked about either religion or maybe their their European heritage, or wherever they came from uh, years ago, hundreds of years ago. Uh, but then it, it doesn't really talk about what does it mean to be white? You know, we always that like here, right? Like this interview, right? Like we might talk to a black coach and be like, oh, what's it like to be a black head coach in the NFL or the SEC or Big Ten? Because there's so few. But we never think about asking the same question to a white person because we don't see how that whiteness matters mm-hmm. uh, because it's kind of a, a dominant lens. It's how we kind of assume things to be normal. And when you take it into coaching, it kind of makes you scratch your head and go, wait a minute now, how do I – how do I see this thing in my interactions with the athletes, the team, you know, the larger practices and how I'm developing this knowledge. Hmm. You know, it kind of shows you some blind spots that we've developed. Yeah. Well, I think that's very true. There are the blind spots and, and, and we, we focus so much on coaches. We want to develop the whole person. I think our coaches do Mm -hmm. a great job of developing the whole person in, um, in what they do in setting up their own program to be a system where, you know, there's equal opportunity for everybody in, in, you know, it's, it's how hard you work and and doing the right thing. So it, it almost becomes a little bit of a microcosm and separate from actually what happens outside of our programs. And I think we need to talk about how do we bridge that gap and we can get to that later, but, you know, really starts with why and when do you integrate the idea of race and white privilege through throughout coach development and and then obviously into your programs how, how do you think about that yeah uh you know i give one example so i just want to, I want to pause and, and lead into i think you're you're displaying too the the curiosity and openness and and how this can be polarizing so i want to i just want to pause and recognize that and you know encourage people to you know, and not just read the chapter. We were able to get the chapter released by the publisher, you know, for free to the public, which is great. Um, and there's a lot of good resources out there. And this is just one chapter in a book. But um, so I just want to note that I, I welcome and appreciate people that are curious to learn this thing and kind of differentiate the ways that people are talking about it. And that, it's, you know, they, they don't have to bury down and get resistance. It's good to uh, think through this thing and it, it may change and it may add to our uh, current understanding of things. So this is one example I'm looking at it right now in, in the book of, uh, and I can remember this so clear. I was talking to, uh, this happened to be a baseball player. I can give you two quick stories when I was in grad school at Tennessee and studying cultural studies and education. Um, and again, we tend not to think about it because we assume that maybe everybody has the same experience in school. And when you I give you these two examples and then we can cl- clearly kind of look and go, wow, that's not this, you know, the same experience I had. And then the one baseball player, uh, we were out working out in the indoor facilities, actually just the two of us one-on-one. Uh, he had to come in for a, a, a private workout or something like that. And uh, he's, we're talking about Band-Aids, and he kind of looks at me and he's like, yeah, I've got you know the flesh-colored Band-Aid on. And he kind of said it like like it was an insult, like a, 
he, he chuckled kind of, but it was one of those like cringes, like it, it was a hurtful chuckle because it's a peach colored or, you know, a, a, a beige colored kind of band aid. And obviously he's got, he had real dark, uh, you know, brown skin. And you realize like, man, you know, I never realized that when I go and look at the flesh colored band aids or put those things on that you assume that, you know, that it's, it's white skin and it's not. And, and it doesn't seem like a good deal, but that guy's embodied, you know, his visceral reaction was like, this is not cool, right? Like this is obviously somebody that it wasn't thinking about my skin color. And it doesn't take a big jump to change the name of the Band-Aid to say, uh, you know, brown Band-Aid or pink Band-Aid, you know, uh, or just not even put it on there, just have a color you know, box if that's what you wanted to do, or just not call it flesh colored because it doesn't reflect in everybody's flesh. Mm-hmm. And then there, so that's, that's one. There's another one, um, and this is for this is a great one and more applicable to football and student success and athletes' success. I remember studying critical race theory, right? And, and the same thing. If you kind of hear these things for the first time and you're scratching your head, going, "Man, what are they talking about? Like this is weird. We're all equal, and and I don't get this stuff." And so you're like, okay, well, how do I have this conversation and how do I bring this up? And, and you, understandably so, you want to be careful because nobody wants to get called a racist. And that happens so much now in today's society, you know, that if you, if you do or say one thing wrong, you know, we're so uh, scared of being called a racist. And it, I think that's unfortunate because, well, we can talk about that. Let me get on with the story. Um, so, Another football player is working out, and uh, I've known him for a couple of years. I was actually going to, walking across campus, uh, doing going to class myself too in, in my doc program. And I said, "What's up to him?" And you know, we're walking together, and I said, "Hey, let me ask you a question, man." He said, "I said, he said, yeah, you know, like, and I kind of pause, right? It's, it's that you know, you know, this is going to be different kind of pause, right? That interaction where it's mm-hmm. you're not like too excited and you're not too down. You're just like, I got a real. I'm trying to understand something." So I said, hey, you know, I'm taking this classwork and reading this stuff. Let me ask you, what's it like being a black man at a predominantly white school like the University of Tennessee? And, like, he kind of just stopped and looked at me like, did you just ask me that? In in a good way. Like, man, like, nobody's really asked me that. None of my coaches asked me that, especially not like a white coach or, not, like, like a, you know, a strength coach. Um, you know, right? It's, it's outside the norm. So, I mean, we sat there and chatted for, you know, maybe it was five, 10 minutes, you know, it wasn't extensive. We had to get going, but he just said, you know, it's hard. Like at times, right. On the football team, you're surrounded by, for the most part of that university, mostly black folk. And then you go to class and you're mostly around white folk. And in his case, he was an offensive lineman. So, you know, physically he stands out, you know, six foot three, 290 pounds. Um, and you got a, a lot of guys like that, and there's not that many other people on campus, and not that many other black people on campus uh, or white people that look like that. So just learning about how he gets treated in the classroom, how people stereotype him, um, the challenges of feeling a sense of belonging. You know, and I think this is why in the chapter I, I use the word group or team, because we think about the team as being all the same or united but you've really got a lot of different people with different experiences. And if you don't ask certain questions, you're not going to get the answers. You're just going to kind of wash over it. And uh, you're going to assume that, you know, everything's kind of hunky dory. But if you've got, you know, in this case, a you know, black man, that's uh, you know, feeling a sense of belonging or he, he eventually, this led into a discussion later in the weight room one day when we were talking about another player on the team, a white player, a starter, a high profile starter, who was using racial jokes in the locker room. And he just looked at me and said, you know, gee, like that's not, that stuff's not funny. Right. You know, and, and this, and this guy was doing it constantly. And it, in the microaggression literature, when you read that stuff, there's a metaphor called death by a thousand cuts. Mm-hmm. And you're just thinking flesh colored bandaid, racial jokes in the locker room, a lack of seeing people that look like you and kind of affirming and asking you questions about your experience as being, you know, uh, in this case, just a black man, but it could intersect with other identities like you talked about. Uh, you start to develop a deeper kind of sense of empathy and a a broader view of people and who we are. And 
it could segue into this kind of issue of colorblindness too, that you really can't assume that we're all the same. In some ways we are, and in some ways we're not. And the point is perhaps to, you know, really dialogue to understand people, uh, to let them pick their path and help them see things and, and improve their vision and understanding. Um, you know, and, and that's more of a social, social cultural character building than, you know, just the typical work hard, work hard, be disciplined, you know, uh, you're going to have success in life. And, and that's not true. Uh, we, we'd like it to be true, but it's not. Yeah, well, I think you bring up that idea of, of color blindness. And, and this, this one kind of struck me as, you know, when I read it, um, because I, I truly believe, you know, and I know so many coaches out there, they're, they're, they're good guys, they're good gals who, who want a program that is free of all those things. They, they truly want that. And, mm-hmm. and you ask them and, and they'll say that exact thing, you know, I'm, I'm colorblind, our program's colorblind. But I guess that in there, you know, lies uh, part, part of uh, the problem or an issue is that, it, you know, the, the failure to recognize the issues that, you know, different, different groups bring to the table, their experiences, the way they feel about things that um, is quite different you know, across. I mean, we want diverse programs. We, you know, you, you don't, in, in any organization, if you have a bunch of people who are all the same, think the same, do the same, you know, you're not really getting anywhere. So um, that's the opportunity. But I guess, you know, we set up the playing field that uh, we we don't address some of those things, right? Be- because maybe they're tough or maybe we're just not even thinking about it. For me, it's, I never thought about it this way till I read it in the chapter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the typical, right? It's just the dominant kind of cultural narratives that we don't think about it. Or I can remember, and this is funny because I, I remember when I was learning about this in class, you know, now what well, was 15 years ago. Um, you know, I learned in my little suburb of Cleveland, Beachwood, Ohio, right? That yep. um, color blindness, we're all the same. Uh, we're, America is a melting pot uh, and other kind of metaphors like that. There's the other one too. Oh gosh. Um yeah, I think maybe it's just the melting pot metaphor that, you know, we all just come together and, and it blends together, you know, but it, 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 again, it just doesn't, it doesn't, uh, there's people that come around that, you know, years later then, and they critique that kind of thing. And so like, wait a minute, now let's think about that. Let's think about how that homogenizing of everything and who that really uh, works for, who that serves. And, and is that desirable? Uh, it, in some ways for unity and for being together and America is unique in that sense, um, having so many different people here. Um, but it, it, it can fail to appreciate, um, you know, the, the racial injustices that happen, the laws, the policies, um, you know, when we start to kind of make these generalizing statements on a team and, you know, unify the team, but then we say and do other things that don't really reflect that unity you know, is where we get in trouble. And then I want to be careful. Like it's not about just offending people, you know, like you're hurting people psychologically, emotionally, um, you know, uh, so we can say those things and then not actively try to recruit, you know, a diverse staff uh, and be welcoming. We, same thing. We talked about it, like in our mission statements, we want everybody to play football or sports and benefit uh, from this and, and build good character values and, uh, friendships, relationships, and be healthy, and etc. Uh, but these types of things never tend to include, you know, social issues. Right. Uh, and so, how how are we really just as a society and fair? And depending on what the rules on the team are, and you can see this like example. This happens and it's come out now. Is you know, like hair hair rules uh, in the military and hair rules in teams often reflects a white person pair. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you can't have cornrows or you can't have braids and twists and different things. Um, you know, and the attire that you wear and the music that you're listening to, um, even the, even, even pregame meals. So, you know, those are things that coaches routinely think about and interact with. And it, it has changed in years too, where coaches now at practices uh, for years have been listening to music or pumping music out there or even dancing or, you know, doing so-called fun things uh, or changing the meals to 
adjust to people's geographic and cultural um, places. You know, right? If you, uh, I, I remember I learned this the hard way too, being trying to order meals for uh, teams down to Tennessee. That uh, if I got something the guys did not like, or they looked at it and was like, "What is this nonsense?" You know, uh, I would I would hear about it from them. So you realize, wait a minute, you know, culture is a big part of the food that we eat and how we bond as a team. Uh, so there is a, a thing there. And we're, so we do these things, you know, we have some open areas uh, and then we've got some blind spots. Yeah. So this is one of those opportunities just to kind of increase uh, the, those, the openness and the awareness of, you know, what's going on. And, you know, it, I, I, we can catastrophize. I'm not going to be able to say it. Ugh, the cat catastrophize or something like that. Like we, <laughs> We can go so far to an extreme too and mock this thing, which I don't want people to do. No. You know. No. Oh, does that mean as a team we're out there, you know, doing, you know, some sort of very public thing, or does that mean I gotta walk around and, you know, preach like this? Like no, no, guys, you don't have to do that. But you know, having an awareness of some of these issues and then seeing moments and opportunities for change and dialogue, um, yeah, we can keep on talking about various ways that, that this actually matters. Yeah, well, I think and before we move any further, that idea of, of colorblindness, and you've mentioned some things there, but um, I guess maybe if we could give a, a, maybe a couple more concrete examples. And, you know, after I had read the chapter, uh, saw a post from Herb Hand on, on Facebook. It said, you know, I'm 52 years old, and I finally understand. And... You know, he he goes on to mention, you know, I I grew up a poor white kid who was just taught that the way you overcome this is you just work hard, you know, educate yourself, work hard, keep working hard, and, and you'll get to where you need to be. And and so that probably is, is, is true for a, a lot of people. But there's, there's other experiences, as we say, that the people were bringing to the table that... Um, there's those obstacles. There's those things that you and I maybe hadn't thought about when we're looking at this and this idea of colorblindness and we're all the same, that everybody's not necessarily coming to the table with the same experiences, that we need to recognize that. We need to understand that. Yeah. Let's, let's point out a few of these things and some of these interesting contradictions. Uh, real quick, there's an, there is an interesting book too uh, called Race Matters, and it kind of in contrast to colorblindness, is trying to explore how race does matter, uh, and not trying to kind of say that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, and and we know how, right in the uh, I think it's, it's Jane Elliott, I believe, does the, the blue eyed brown eyed experiment. That's pretty interesting. Um, and then you also touched on kind of this idea of meritocracy, really, that if I work hard, good things will happen. There was just another research study that just revealed that um, intelligence is less of a predictor. And we've, we've had other research like this, but intelligence or work ethic is less of a predictor than uh, just coming from a privileged or a economically privileged family mm -hmm. uh, and having wealth, and having wealth, right? We know that wealth builds opportunities and, um, you know, and, and we see this in sports, right? So let's use the example of, you know, right. If I'm, if I'm leading a program and I can hire a career counselor I can buy, buy suits for the team. I can give them practice on how to interview. We work on the resume and skill building, right? So now we're going to transfer the work ethic, hopefully that they develop from football and uh, school and their in, uh, education into job readiness. We 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 uh, introduce them to an alumni, maybe a donor of the program as well. You know, they graduate. Next thing you know, they got a job. Uh, you know, the idea of what we're doing right there is is contrast to meritocracy in a way because we're providing the resources and the pipeline for somebody to be successful right and a lot of coaches nowadays are really in tune to that because they're going to say you know our program is going to help you get a job and and they do these things they kind of gain the system and you saw this with uh various wealthy people lately that got busted for putting their unqualified kid or or a non-athlete on an athletic team mm-hmm so, you know, the system is not fair. And the point is, guys, not to point that out, but the point is to reform the system, too. If things are not fair, we should try to make them more fair. Uh, and when we use language like, right, it's equal opportunity for all, and it's a meritocracy, like, we have to actually do the things to work towards that. It's it's not, 
good to say that and to actually not have a system in place that uh, leads to those outcomes and has that values. And, and all of the things we just talked about really kind of fit into that whole idea of developing our own intrapersonal knowledge about race. So, you know, whether it's, you know, I, I do think we need to read. I do think there's some good books out there. I'm constantly right now searching for those and trying to figure out what, what should I read. And, um, you know, so that's part of the process. We have to have that intrapersonal knowledge that we develop in, in, that that when we look at coach education, that we make sure that our our young coaches coming into this are developing that as well. Yep. Well, and let me touch on that, and then the the forms of privilege that you just talked about. Is, and in your one gentleman, Herb, that privilege as a term just means you've kind of got to step ahead. And we can extend that thinking to racial privilege, right? As a white person, truly, I've never thought about not getting a job in general for the for on average. You know, because I was a white man, um, you know, whereas black coaches, black athletes, you know, others have that experience and there's various forms of bias and we know what happens. There's enough research to show basically the same resume is read differently if you have a black sounding name versus a white sounding name. Um, so these forms of implicit, we call it implicit bias usually um, exists. And then the same thing about privilege, understanding privilege. A lot of people are quick to dismiss it without looking at. Okay, like I was saying, you can have economic privilege, you can have geographic privilege, right? If you grew up in a certain area next to a park, you're very fortunate. It's not just mean you have to get rid of the park. Now, now we say, well, what's next? Do we get rid of a park? Does everybody need a park? Uh, should I not use the park? And we start to kind of like get off uh, the focus of, well, let's stop and understand privilege again. And let's build towards what we've just said about having a more just and fair and a caring society. You know, these interactions as well as the policies and, and ways that we make decisions, uh, not just interpersonally, but as an organization. So we can layer that idea of privilege with different forms. The same thing of, uh, and, and these are uncomfortable conversations because we don't know it. We don't talk about it. So I, I, we can segue it with coaching education that you brought up that when you think about intrapersonal knowledge and reflective practice, I had this conversation yesterday um, with, with one of our students because a lot of those frameworks don't actually include identity, social, cultural, intersectional issues. It's what's your problem? Um, my problem is the athletes aren't motivated. Okay. Well, what do you know about motivation? Um, you, know, you know, maybe not much, or I read one book on it. Okay. Well, let's look at different research and theories on motivation and let's look at, you know, the intrinsic, extrinsic motivation and blah, blah, blah. And, and a lot of this stuff doesn't actually stop and say, maybe the problem isn't motivation. Maybe the problem is it's, it's a lack of cultural awareness to you know, say things and do practices that are more supportive and therefore more motivating towards people. Uh, maybe they don't have the resources they need to be successful. And it's not just a, a, a so-called, you know, motivation problem where, uh, you know, they've got it or they don't. Um, so a lot of those frameworks for interpersonal reflective practice or they're almost kind of gender or uh, racial neutral, colorblind. And so trying to help coaches see these things and even ourselves trying to write about this stuff in sport, because it, it's just not so heavily talked about at all. And you can think about the state clinics or the national clinics that you go to. And, you know, the popular topics that coaches talk about is, is, you know, X's and O's and maybe leadership. But again, leadership is so often defined in a non- uh, identity, a non-inclusive way. So I, I think this is a really great opportunity to kind of be, on, be thinking like this and exploring new ways of thinking. Because again, if all you're doing is hearing the same stuff, you, you're really not growing at all. Uh, so Keith, I'll, I'll mention for the people that are listening that we just got interrupted by your dogs barking. And, <laughs> and I'll talk about that as a, a quick example of Right, like imagine you're at home, right? Because so many people are at home right now because of COVID and you're stuck inside. Well, what if you don't live in a nice place? Or what if you've got, you know, like dogs or kids or multiple family members and extended family and you're trying to study, you're trying to work out, you know, maybe there's uh, people right, have been laid off and they're uncertain about their future. All of these things, and we know that the, you know, the, the, the statistics are showing that this is affecting people of color and lower 
uh, income, lower wealth people more. It's harder, right? Again, the saying work hard or, you know, all you got to do is keep going, like that's not a solution to a systemic societal problem. Right. And that, that's kind of like a key point is just trying to make things more fair uh, because they're really not. You know, the same thing with the Rooney Rule and the NFL and those types of things is that you're trying to address a longstanding history uh, and a larger social issue, not just a minor inconvenience of one person or like a personal problem. Uh, so I just want to point that out because I think we can see that too. And that's exactly why, you know, the, the, the NFL teams and the colleges that have the financial resources, they spend it. They spend it on trainers and strength coaches and nutritionists and facilities and massage therapists and financial advisors and, and everything because they're just resourcing everybody to the tilt because it gives them a leg up. Great. You know, I'd just like to see it maybe be a little bit more uh, equal for everybody. So, uh, the other example or the story I was going to share too was about a coach down in Mississippi and I'll, I'll hold back everybody's names and that kind of thing. And I don't like to put people on the spot. And, and that's exactly why I wrote the book chapter about myself, because I don't really, again, I don't really uh, care and I'm not really worried about it to me. Like I had, I had somebody reach out to me on Twitter and I said, Oh, you, you know, get ready for the hateful comments. And I really don't get very many. Um, I think anybody who reads this chapter too, I would, I would love for them to read it, engage with it and tell me, you know, uh, you know, what'd you think, but also it's not really open for, you know, debate in the terms of its accuracy uh, versus like, let's extend the thought and the dialogue. Uh, I want to hear from people about that thing, uh, but I don't get too many, you know, Twitter trolls and that kind of thing. And, and I don't know if it's a white privilege type of thing, but people really probably as a, as a male too, and, and being kind of, you know, uh, uh, authoritative that people aren't, I guess they don't feel like they can pick on me as easily. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I see that happen to other people and I don't like that. I never have, you know, and then I took, I took the, the coach's message in high school. I'm getting off track, but I'm coming around. But, you know, when the coach says you, you take care of, your, you know, of yourself and other people, uh, you know, you stick up for the little guy. And as a member of the football team or anything like that, you don't pick on people. You're probably bigger and stronger. You don't pick on people. You know, you stand up for the little guy at school and you help everybody. Um, and there's examples of that. And there's examples where bullying still happens. So anyway, it kind of brings it up, and I, and I want to mention that. So the, the story was when I was coaching down in Mississippi, our, our, one of our coaches uh, had a friend, an older gentleman, uh, pass away. And the coach at the end of practice one day, and we had a, a – about a 50, 50% kind of black and white team, um, a little bit of other ethnic, um, and nationalities in there, but, but at a smaller rate. Um, so of the 70 players, it was, you know, uh, let's say 45, 45, and then 10% in, uh, in, in other categories as, as we would categorize them. But the coach really gave this 10 minute long, I mean, guys were circled up, but they weren't just circled up and looking at the coach because they had to you know, because the coach, it was the head coach and it was his authority. He started talking about his friend who was an, an African-American football player and, and person and a great guy. And the coach just, you could tell the love that this coach had for this man. And they played football together at junior college and stayed in touch. And, you know, they all did their things and this and that. And eventually died. And this, this man too was also, I think, uh, the first player uh, the first black player on the team. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't know if it was a, a whole conference wise, but almost like a, like a kind of like a Jackie Robinson type of story. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and you can think about Mississippi back in the you know fifties and sixties and seventies and that sort of thing. And, and just listening to the coach speak with such admiration and affection, you know, the sort of not hard, you know, tough guy routine that we so often get but a, a really a deep care and empathetic in a relationship uh, to know this man and to see what he's done and what he's overcome and how he struggled and how today, and, he's, and he, he connected it eventually to the team and said, you know, look around you, look next to you. You know, the fact that we can all get together and do these things is because of progress. And so it's, you know, while we want to look at our current day and age, we want to also celebrate that we do have things that have gotten a lot better but we also have work to go. And that's not a, an offensive or a controversial thing. 
that should strike us as like, yes, good. Like, wow, they had their issues of the day. And eventually after, right, some people got killed or murdered or, um, you know, really struggled. We're not like that anymore. It's different. And in different ways, we have different ways that people are held back. But that on the surface level is a lot of growth. That's improvement. Let's, let's celebrate that. You know, um, let's eulogize that. Let's have those moving stories. But let's also be critical about our current age and not put our head in the sand thinking that, well, that was years ago and those sorts of things don't happen because they still do. I mean, I lived in Mississippi for five years and there was a black man at the time that was dragged from the back of a truck by a chain and killed. So it may not happen, you know, to the same extent, but these types of things happen. Uh, they happen to people of color. They happen to, uh, you know, uh, women. They happen to people that are trans or gay. And those folks get hurt more than other people. And, you know, we can't sit around and say, we're going to build character and we're going to care about other people. And you got to stick up for everybody and not help uplift people. And, you know, that, that really shouldn't be a controversial thing. How we go about doing it and the steps that we can take are going to vary. But the idea that we're going to be critical about ourselves and, you know, try to really help the world be a better place through greater equality and, uplifting people for me is, is the foundation and, and that's the message. And, you know, I think you shed a lot of light here and certainly there's for anybody listening, there's more work to be done than, you know, what Dr. Garrity has talked about, but, you know, looking at this and then extending it to, um, being able to now start to take action on this. Uh, we understand better, um, we're continuing to learn more about each other. How do we start then making this something that is actionable for our programs? I know you do it as far as coach education. How do we extend that to our programs? And then I'll ask you a little bit later, maybe the, the idea of then once, you know, maybe we, I've said our programs have always been great examples, but this is something we need to address. Then how do we extend that to the larger community? So we'll get to that part next. But how do we start taking some action on what we learn? You know, I really wish there were, and I, this is where I need to continue to improve because it, it has got me to the point where I think of programs or interventions, you know, um, educational opportunities, et cetera, to where we can invoke this change. And, and there are plenty of examples. And we often, and this is a big question, we often think of like a, a magic wand solution. And if I could wave that wand, I'd, I'd just sure. go ahead and do it. Um, and, it, it, you know, it's not like, okay, it's, it's not the X's and O's. And this is what we have to appreciate about in coaching education is that these things are fundamentally different. If you want to, I always say, if you want to learn how to squat, right, you know, do a back squat, I'm not just going to like tell you about it. You're going to squat the same thing, right? If you've got 10 guys in the box, you may want to try to throw the ball. Right. Like you can kind of understand these principles, yep. but that's tactical or physical sort of things. Here we're talking more about a social psychological thing. And so one, let's, let's appreciate that these things are different and not maybe use the analogies that I just did as an equal thing. Right. Right. And, and be so quick to dismiss. We have to appreciate that there's different knowledges and skills require different ways of learning and uh, different ways of uh, it, facilitating action and then evaluating and assessing that action too. Uh, so, you know, I know you and for others too, that are teachers and coaches, you know, what I just implicitly talked about is almost like an instructional design uh, theory, right? It's, it's thinking about the problems, potential solutions, uh, evaluating it. So, and, and then connecting it to what are you really trying to get done? That being, that being the foreground of this, the foundation, you know, in, in the book and, and elsewhere, I think about individual, level organizational um, and societal. So as an individual, can I be aware of, can I film and watch myself at practice and listen to the type of communication that I offer? Uh, can I listen to myself in the locker room or in the weight room or downtime or in the meeting room or film room with players? What do I say? And, and more importantly, we can get at the difference between intention and impact. I might intend something, but the impact of it might be something greater or something different. So again, we have to remember that this isn't about just you. It's about the relationship you have with 
individual players and others. Right. So if if your impact on you know a young person is such that it hurts them or you think it might hurt them, you may want to ask them or talk to them, you know, about these types of things. You know, how do you want to be talked to? How do you want to be coached? And what's good for you might not be good for them. And and that can be a hard thing. It's a really hard thing to juggle when you're coaching, you know, 10, 20, you know, 100 people on the, you know, depending on what position maybe you're coaching or if you got the, you know, coordinator or, or head coach. So there's there's one example of an individual level kind of thing is looking at that communication, um, you know, uh, and you can have people, you, you can have meals. I mean, this is one of the greatest things back in the day too, is to have those cultural meals, get together and do that type of thing. Um, you can even intersect this with motor learning and feedback, you know, that when you're looking at trying to develop somebody's skills, what sort of, you know, cues and instructional metaphors are you giving? And are you resonating with somebody that some, that, that it resonates and is meaningful for them? Or does it flop because you really don't understand that person and you don't understand their background? So it can, it can be a tool for improvement. Yeah. I, I really love that idea. I mean, you mentioned, you know, filming yourself in practice, you know, when, when, especially you think about your individual period, when you do have those, those players on the field that you're coaching up. And I think sometimes, um, you know, with, with any kid, this has nothing to do with race. We, you know, we, we, we hang our hat on, well, I coach them hard. They know I love them. Um, but you know, what are you saying? What are your words you know, if you're out there and, and once or twice a week you, you grab a manager or maybe an injured player and say, hey, I want you just to film my whole individual period, stand here, hold that camera, you go back and review. I think reflection is such an important part of of teaching and coaching. If, if you don't reflect on what you're doing, you're really not getting better because it's such a dynamic um, profession and everything that you do, activity, coaching, teaching, is, is you know, understanding what did I say and, and looking, I mean, we're good at analyzing film, right? That's what coaches do. Oh, here's why this didn't work. Uh, but when you have that situation and you said something, which maybe you, you thought, well, I, I did that to motivate that kid. And then you don't see the response or the action out of that kid or maybe a negative response. I think it's a huge opportunity to to, to call call that kid in. And again, nothing to do with, with race here, but to call that kid in and, and say, hey, um, you know, here's what I was trying to do and show them the film, you know, but you didn't respond to that very well. Why was that? Right. And, and I think some of those things will come up, you know, the, the issue that every kid face, I mean, you know, I, we won't get it into to it today. We had talked about it before on this podcast, but you know, sometimes it's even mental health issues that we're not aware of. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, all kinds of things. And I think just that opportunity though, will really help you understand in, in this regard and what we're talking about with race, maybe some of those things that, uh, we incorrectly well, assume. I mean, the mental health issue is interesting because, again, we know that, you know, again, less privileged groups, people of color, such that have um, less, you know, well-being and, and they suffer from various mental health issues as a result of race and discrimination. Imagine now you have a coach, though, that is aware of that mm -hmm. and that can affirm you know, in a subtle way, like, and again, we call these micro affirmations. If you can say to an athlete, you know, a couple of things, one, like, Hey, I, I might not understand everything you guys are going through and what it's like to be you, but I'll listen right. and I'm here for you. And I'm here to dialogue and understand. And I want to understand, uh, yes, I'm still coaching. And I still got to coach you up and, but that may help us all get better. Um, and, and, and what a privilege it is for me to be here with you guys, to be able to coach you and, for all of us to get together and do this sort of thing and, and have this experience um, to grow on the field as well as to sustain relationships and grow off the field and be supportive, building community. And, and another thing that stood out to me too is when you said that is one of the things the coaches could reflect upon too is their communication or their, their ways that they frame to athletes, you know, their, the athlete's success. For example, there's some research that shows uh, – Coaches in society tend to talk about this great white warrior, uh, hardworking athlete versus the naturally gifted, you know, black athlete. Right. And that is really a, to use the language, it, you know, it, it would be a racist assumption. It would just be a, wait a minute now, guys, um, to think that 
a certain athlete is only physically gifted and, and, and exceeds because of their physical gifts, specifically because of their skin color. Like that's really problematic and offensive. Um, and, and you can think of examples. And again, it's not to say that anybody's in the wrong here, but this is a, a kind of a, a discourse or a way of knowing that's out there. And that, you know, that was used, years ago not as much now to to really harm uh, black athletes they weren't right we always we never had black quarterbacks because it was assumed that they weren't smart enough to do it and and that kind of stuff right has gone away as we've kind of been uh, more understanding and we realized that these were really good athletes and uh, it'd be silly not to have a minimal quarterback um but, but that kind of language of whether well, non-intelligent white quarterback has faded away some to some extent. Mm-hmm. And, and those are the sorts of talent identification or, or theories of excellence that uh, we got to critique and, and that may, we may find them slipping into our coaching uh, rather than uh, a, a more thorough understanding of really what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think in extending that kind of idea to the coach and it came up, on you know the podcast the other day I had with the, the title of it was Build the Bridge with Kahari Hicks and Max Stevens and um, you know we were talking and I can't remember if it was on air or off but you know one of those coaches made the point like there's there's this uh, misconception or stereotype that you know black a black coach is having his success because he's got more talented athletes rather than he really knows his stuff, yep. which is again, another yep. one of those that's, that's incorrect. It's wrong, but, but that's, what's out there. Out there. Uh, and shout, we'll give a shout out to high tie. Um, yeah. I don't know if you know, okay, that's my, that's my mom's old school district. Okay. I, I knew you were an East Sider. I didn't know. I didn't know exactly where. Yeah. So I grew I grew up in you know a town over Cleveland Heights University Heights is next to Beechwood and then but my mom was the eventually she was a teacher principal and then superintendent of Heights High. Um, well, we'll give a we'll give a shout out to to Beechwood too because Coach Creel, <laughs> who's the head coach at uh, Beechwood, yeah. Dam- Damian Creel, yeah. he's he's actually involved in the Build a Bridge project too. He just yeah. he just didn't appear on the podcast with us. Yeah, yeah. Damian was the senior when I was a freshman. I, I saw I went back for a game. I think it was last year, two years ago now, and just saw him for just a minute. But, yeah, you look at that and just going like, yeah, that diversity, especially like high tide, like if you don't have that diversity in your staff to interact with the kids, I mean, the kids and people, we know this too from research that people you know, generally kind of gravitate towards people that look uh, like them. It's a phenomenon that kind of happens. And so now you've got to figure out, well, how do we function as a team and how do we embrace uh, that natural kind of disposition um, and, and try to interact with. So we've got a, a coach that can, you know, reach out to every kid and every kid feels valued and cared for and, and has a person they can share things with and share their, and relieve that mental health stress um, and talk about, you know, like, I don't like the way this coach is talking to me or he's yelling at me all the time and I don't understand why, uh, or why is this coach giving me a hard time? Um and if all of your coaches kind of look like white coaches doing that to you and you're a black man, like that's a different experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's a great case of um, how you, you would, and, and the same thing, not pit, not pigeonholing certain coaches in certain positions. Cause the other thing is, right. We get these, you know, black coaches often get uh, labeled as just the recruiting coach because it's their job to go out and recruit the black kids versus right. actually, you know, become a coordinator and a head coach, you know, like, you know, you're, you're good enough for that, but you're not good enough for the coordinator head coach position. Like, come on guys, give people a shot and grow them and, and, you know, don't hold those uh, assumptions against people and, you know, the things to be aware of um, as a reason why people, you don't see them in these positions. It's not a lack of ability. It's a lack of opportunity and right. subtle forms of discrimination. Yeah, no, Exactly. Um, and, and we kind of got off track as we got into some different examples. I know um, we mentioned the interpersonal and interpersonal, um, you know, organizational and societal are uh, another way that you look at this as well. Yeah, well, I mean, as we're talking about that, you know, who's making the decisions? The head coaches, maybe the athletic directors and owners, 
or maybe there's some sort of advisory board and what's the composition of those types of things. Um, you know, we, we, and we, we, people like me and, and they kind of do this work when you see a, a picture of, uh, you know, a diversity uh, conference or a summit or a, or a zoom chat nowadays. And the whole lineup is nothing but, you know, white people or the same thing. They're going to be, I've seen this and you think it's crazy to say, uh, we're going to do a, a gender talk about empowering women and the whole lineup is all men. And you're just like, who comes up with this stuff, right? Like who actually thinks this is a good idea? Um, you know, the same thing in, in, you look at it, we just did it again this week. Uh, I had an alumni reach out and did a quick analysis of um, speakers at conferences. And as, as you might expect, it's mostly white men. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? Yeah. You, you need to diversify the, the lineup in this case, but also change who's making some of these decisions. And if you can't do it, good. Okay. Bring other people on, have a, a, a organization that has a diversity inclusivity plan. And one of the aspects of the plan is exactly forming this sort of uh, group that can actually make meaningful change and not uh, talk about it or just have it. And then different. You hear that? I got the air force right overhead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you, you have, if you form a board like this, you have to empower them to make decisions and maybe make it public and transparent so they can be accountable. Right. And, and it's kind of like a give and take. You're trying to do this thing and don't make it a, an in name only or a token thing. That's not the point, And it's not a PR stunt. It, it's about meaningful, positive growth and improvement. Uh, so find ways to hold yourself accountable. And, you know, Quite frankly, a lot of coaches or the you know, owners, administrators, they don't want to be held accountable. They love to have uh, total authority. They'll critique it on one side, but then if it comes to them, they you know, hey, I don't want that. That's not good. For, I mean, the other guys. Yeah. Like, guys, build the system, right? If you think that the, the, the so-called founding fathers had a great system, build the system to have checks and balances uh, because you know uh, there's pressures and you know, people are going to make mistakes. So build a better system. Do it. Uh, to, to wrap things up, Brian, and, and this is something I think, again, we're, we're trying to learn and, and discover what we can do better here, uh, find ways to, to make a difference in our teams, in our communities. Uh, you suggest three activities um, here for, for coaches. And, you know, I know not all of our coaches here are just learning to be. I think, you know, like I mentioned Herb a hand earlier, 52 years now, I finally get it. You know, mm-hmm. what, what can we do in, in that regard as, as coaches? And you listed a, a few activities there. Well, one actually it just came out. I just saw um, Joe, Dr. Joe Fagan has this book called The White Racial Frame. And, it, and then the new edition just came out. So actually, I just recommended that to my dad, too. Uh, he's, he's how old is my dad? He's 80 years old. Um, and so it's probably the best book to understand, you know, kind of like, in a, in a really thorough way to understand whiteness. There's other good books out there. Um, I would also just read too and, and uh, read about, you know, like I, I mentioned Cornell West and, and race matters and there's a variety of other folks in the book, you know, read books by other authors that aren't like you and, mm-hmm. you know, go back and look at uh, W. Du Bois. Uh, I started listening to again on, on, uh, well, actually on YouTube. It's a, I found a free audio book of the souls of black folks and I have a hard copy you know, but we're limited for time and I've been out riding my bike and trying to do some things. So I listen to it on YouTube and it's, and it's more convenient to hear it there. And you just start going and thinking like, man, like, you know, yeah, this guy was maybe talking about a hundred plus years ago, but what are the contemporary people talking about? What's their experience like? Um, so that part of, of really listening, understanding, you know, then, and then engaging in dialogue and open it and having, and if you need to write it down, this could probably be a good exercise too, is to write down some open-ended questions and try to have this conversation where you're in in research world, and especially in interviews, you're trying to understand the other person for who they are and what they are. You're not trying to direct them. You're not trying to probe and question them. And that was a really useful thing. Uh, I did this training program called sustained dialogue a few years ago. And in that program, they differentiate between debate, discussion, and dialogue. And the words in themselves 
you know, don't have meetings. We give them meetings. And we differentiated it between debate is like, you know, like you, you and I going back and forth between the merits of, you know, the wing tee versus spread. You know, we can, or different types of defenses, uh, you know, cover two and three versus, you know, spread or whatever. Um, we could debate that. We could also have a discussion like we're doing now. Where we're kind of probing topics and exploring issues. We could also have dialogue where we are more engaged in understanding the other person to eventually build a relationship uh, towards an outcome of you know, greater improvement uh, you know, in the team process. And you can see these things. And I won't name anybody again, uh, and I don't want to put people out there, but you can see coaches now talking about, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen. We're going to have meetings. I'm going to, I'm personally going to change and we're going to change the, the organization and the team in order to listen and take action. And hopefully that comes from a place of dialogue and sustained dialogue is a framework that actually permits that. So and there could be another thing to, you know, go on the sustained dialogue website and just look at some of the tools and, and not to slip into debate and discussion. And that really is what so much we do nowadays and why nothing gets done is we're too busy attacking and posting and tweeting and, you know, throwing around barbs and parroting, you know, nonsense that we hear from somewhere versus I'm a human being, you're a human being. Um, we are all, we are all relational. I want to interact with you. Um, you know, how can we get together and understand each other to, to get on the same page? Um, yeah, I saw it. I, I, there was one public example in, in Colorado too. The uh, first black coach of this one rural school took the team over recently to the police department. So there's the, there's the next level, Keith, right? Like uh, that's the societal, you know, moving from just your organization to the larger community, right? Bring in, you know, and again, you got to be careful about it just because, you know, bringing in the police can be really um, traumatizing or hurtful if it's not done well. And I kind of believe, I think like most people, that there are fringes and there's, forces and the media and there's, you know, individuals and groups that are very inflammatory. And I think most of us, quite frankly, and having lived in four different states for years, I think most of us are trying to figure out how to bring people together. And so, yeah, you can take your team to the police department or bring the police department, you know, and officers to the team and start to build relationships and dialogue uh, and to understand where each person's coming from and, how do we have a, you know, a, a, a dialogue then about a safe society that helps everybody? And what does that look like? Uh, and what does it look like now as well as into the future when we're going to change and things will change and we affect that change. So uh, it's not a static process, right? And that's another kind of complication is that we're constantly um, being changed while we're changing. Well, I know uh, the chapter is out there, and it, I would share the uh, the address, but it's kind of a complicated one, so I will put it in the show notes uh, for coaches, and I really encourage you um, to read this, to share this with your coaching staffs, to share it with uh, coaches of other sport in your building, because uh, I think it's this is a really good start here is, again, starting that understanding, that education, and as I mentioned, Dr. Garrity put some some activities in there, uh, some steps that you can take because ultimately, you know, the understanding has to lead to some action here. Uh, Brian, I appreciate you joining me again and, and sharing all of these things. And um, I hope to be able to, to have you back here and, and talk about uh, some more issues that affect us uh, right now during these times. Yeah. Well, thanks again for having me, Keith. Um, you know, I know we mentioned the book and I'm, uh, I hesitate to promote and if anybody's ever wondering, you don't, you don't make much money at all. Uh, and I haven't, I haven't gotten a royalty. Selling, selling academic books is not, uh, the, the way to uh, financial freedom, <laughs> but, uh, and, and the publisher Rutledge did put it out there for free for this chapter. Um, and so, yeah, we're happy to share it. And I, and I appreciate them doing that. And I hope it starts something more too, because we're frankly, thinking this stuff and writing this way is challenging for me. I know it's challenging for others that really are curious and want to do the right things and just sometimes struggle with the tools and it makes sense, right? It's, 
and don't blame yourself. It, it makes sense that we don't have the tools for this type of thing. So, yeah, thank you. You know, I think USA football, others for listening to and trying to do these types of things, you know, in a uh, constructive manner. Um, and again, I, I say that like that, you know, we don't all agree on what's constructive, but, you know, we can, we can take baby steps and grow and, and eventually it's going to pay off one way or the other. You know, it might just be with you. It might be with you know, one player. It could be the team, the organization, uh, you know, the larger community, but, you know, staying around and not doing anything and, and being status quo. Uh, that, that's one of those times where you're going to look back and go, you know, I, I, and regret it. You're going to go, I wish I would have made a change. And I, I could have made a positive difference in, you know, my life and the life of others and it actually made a, a greater impact, I think, in the, in the public good. So thank you, guys. Thank you for listening to the Coaching Coordinator Podcast. As always, we try to get you timely topics, topics that matter to you right now as coaches, and I certainly appreciate Dr. Garrity taking the time to share the work that he's done. Please stay tuned for our preseason series, which will be coming up, our training camp series Uh, as well as other great guests on the podcast. And for your youth community, for those of you who are in charge of the whole program, K-12, through please check out the Football for All podcast and share that with your youth football stakeholders. If you are looking for systems to train blocking, defeating blocks, and tackling, check out footballdevelopment.com. We have our three systems there. Uh, including our free shoulder tackle system, which was put together with the Seattle Seahawks, also known as the Hawk Tackle. Again, that's at footballdevelopment.com.